G'day, Paul Air here from Rotec Aerosport. Um, back for another oh, engineering piece, I guess. So people that know me, 57 year old guy, I've been immersed in mechanical engineering my entire life. I'm not formal, but I've, uh, I've put my entire life into engine design and piston engines in general, particularly aircraft engines. Uh, it's just, it's just what I do. It's something I'm very passionate about. And I've learned a pretty good understanding over the years, uh, just mainly through practical experience, school of hard knocks, um, and applying decent logic and reason, listening to what others have got to say, and then formulating my own sort of uh, conclusions. Now, on that topic, I've got some ideas about these Jabiru cranks and what I believe could possibly be going on, and I'll just throw it out there, but these are my thoughts. So this particular engine here is one I showed earlier, um, and it had a failed crankshaft. And the crankshaft, as you can see, the engine's upside down. It's broken at that first web there. Now that first web is about 10 millimetres thick, that steel sort of plate it makes. You can see it's broken right through the middle of that web. Of course, now, it's very easy to put the blame on this long, long prop shaft, uh, which is about twice as long as the longest prop flange that Jabiru supply. You can see the comparison there if I put them next to each other. About there. Yeah, so it's considerably longer than that. Now, of course, anybody that understands the gyroscopic forces of a, of a, a propeller knows that there's enormous loads transmitted back to the crankshaft. Now, one of the problems with a direct drive crankshaft is it has to bear the load of the propeller. It not only has to drive the engine, but it has to bear the load of the propeller. Whereas a geared engine like our radials, the propeller reduction unit takes care of all the load of the prop because the engine is not actually rigidly attached to the redrive. Uh, so the, the redrive is taking all the load and there's a significant distance between right back here and sort of around here where the bearings that support the prop shaft are. So, and of course we have our flange right back, right back, I can't, can't get in there, right back in there, hard against the main bearing. So any of this sort of side load is taken by the gearbox and the gearbox prop shaft is well supported and isolated from what we would call the motor. But the problem with the direct drive engine is the motor and the crankshaft or the redrive or the prop drive, let's say, is the, one of the same things. Now the way I see it is because you can't isolate the two like we do on our radials and the Rotax 912, you have to have a section of the crankshaft that's specifically designed to take the loads of the propeller. And more, not just the weight of the propeller, of course, it's the exaggerated loads from the gyroscopic precession, which are enormous. Anybody who's seen those, where they spin a, you know, a, a bicycle wheel on, a, on an axle and you hold it in your hand and you go to turn it and it literally almost tips you onto your, your face. The loads are enormous. Now imagine that being a much bigger mass of a propeller, bigger diameter at 3,000 RPM. I mean, it's just enormous, the loads. And of course, you exaggerate them with this ridiculous um, prop flange, uh, and you're going to get this problem. Now, this prop flange, although it's the crux of this problem, is not the problem, the main problem. In my opinion, the design of this um, front of this engine is quite weak because the supported area, I wish I had this crankcase apart. Maybe this one's better to explain it. So the supported area of the Jabiru crankcase is really, there's a, there's a bearing there, a shell bearing there, and then there's one about there. So they're only about that distance apart, not even three fingers, right? Three, not even three fingers apart. There's a bearing there, and there's a bearing there. And those two bearings are designed to take the entire load of the propeller all its gyroscopic forces, all of its loads, okay? Now to make things, so you've got very little support and I'll demonstrate how little support you've got in a minute. Because at the moment when you move the crankshaft, it feels very strong in all axes, right? That's because it's going right through here. But, but and of course with the, you know, my hand is not very powerful, so I can't bend the crankshaft. But believe me, the, cr the prop can. The prop can bend the crankshaft. And so all of these support bearings here are keeping this section of the crankshaft rigid. But of course the flex is happening through that front web. If there's any flex in those two bearings, which are poorly separated in my opinion, and don't offer that much bearing support in axial loads, 
then, the, then this web here is going to act like a swash plate, like a helicopter swash plate. It's going to flex like a flex plate. So as you're manoeuvring around, that, that first web there is being exposed to enormous flex, right? It's, taking, it's basically taking everything. Any movement in these two bearings is going to be transmitted directly to that web because by the time all the load goes through these cranks, the, the rest of the crank, it's too well supported. So all the flex is going to be right there. And lo and behold, that is exactly where this crankshaft is broken. Now, all this prop flange has done is, in my opinion, has exacerbated and highlighted, you know, focused the point on the weak area. So if I was del deliberately building an engine where I wanted to find the weak point of the crank, I would build a prop flange like this to put excessive loads and see where the failure point is, and that's where it is. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's where cranks are failing. Now, this is a billet crank, and we know why it's failed here, but I still reckon that's the weak area because of the uns unsupported bearing area. Remember, behind that seal, that seal's not a bearing. The bearing starts right there, and it finishes about there. So it's only that wide, those two bearings. Now, on a Lycoming engine, a Continental, that's a substantial bearing. It's much longer. It's about, the, it's about six inches long, and it's huge because it's got to take all those loads. Now, let's have a look. With this web now disconnected from the crank, so unlike this crank, it's not fully supported through the entire crankcase. It's only supported on the two bearings that I'm exposing there, right, or that I'm highlighting. Now, let's take a look. Now, I can't... It's difficult. You can see it there, right? It's difficult. You can hear it. Now, I can't... You can't probably see it, but that's moving a hell of a lot, right? That's moving a hell of a lot. That's moving about two millimetres up and down. Now, of course, now that two millimetres has been exposed because it's no longer corrected to, connected to the rest of the crankshaft, and now it's only being supported by those two bearings that I'm, I'm, I'm complaining about. Okay, so what you've got is effectively that movement there under normal circumstances being, is being retained by the web, and that is exactly where it's failed. So what you're feeling there, you can see in here, is the movement that's being re restricted or stopped by that web. Now, of course, that web can fatigue and crack, and that's exactly what I submit has happened. You see, it's broken right through. Now it's exposed that movement. Now, just because we go and put a shorter flange on your engine like this doesn't necessarily mean that the problem's gone. It just means that there's less load uh, on the same in the same weak spot, which is right in there, which is right there, that web there. That web right there, see? Right there. That web right there is where it cracked. So you put a flange even that long on it, um, and I still believe it's, you know, a problematic. Now, you, they're probably getting away with it, but it's still not ideal. In my opinion, rather than having a long prop, prop extension, even the Jabiru one, you would have been better designed the nose of the engine so the prop flange was sh short and the end bearing was huge. Supported all the way up to say here even, with a, with a nose. And then you wouldn't have had to have a, a long prop flange. You would have been able to have a short prop flange with a longer nose with more support bearings. Now I'm gonna go out on a limb here, and this is just my speculation that the forge cranks which are being recalled are weaker than the billet crank and so they're cracking there much easier. They're failing right there. I haven't seen any, I do, I do know of one, but that is where I would surmise and speculate that they're going to fail. Because the billet crank will fail there, as we know, right here. And that was caused by this exaggerating the problem. But the problem still exists. And the forge crank I'm going to speculate is, is cracking much easier there than a billet crank. But the problem is really the design of the unsupported area here, which again is exaggerated by this ridiculous prop flange. But this is not much better. Not much better. See, on the Rotec engine, I'm not saying we're God's gift to you know, mechanical engineering, but we designed our prop flange so that it was like that. And this bit here, which is smaller on a taper or a spline taper, sits inside the, the propeller. And the flange is right here against the bearing, just like that. But Jabiru and others, I guess, not to be critical, have designed it like that and put the bolts right, right deep in there. And that, of course, is to, to suit the shape of the aircraft so that they can get the cow to, to form, you know, to shape nicely.
But if they had have designed the engine so they had a longer nose on it, you'd still be able to get the same result and have a much shorter flange. Now my mind, my mind sort of goes in ahead and thinks, well, maybe I could build some sort of retro support, and you know, pff, these are just things I think about. But I think that's the crux of the problem. I, 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 you know, I'm just putting it out there that this is a lot of unsupported crank sticking out here that's transmitting its loads to, to a, a relatively small portion of bearing, which, as I said, compared to more serious engines like, like Cummings and Continentals, are huge. That front bearing area there on the, on, the, on the crank of a Lycoming is about that long. Huge, right? Not this long. Literally that long. That is the length of where my fingers are now. That's where the two bearings lie. Anyway, uh, we just do the best we can with what we've got, and I think um, we, we plough on. But that, to me, is what's going on with the crank recall. I would go out on a limb and say there's actually nothing wrong with the forged cranks. It's just that they're, they're unsupported, and they're, ex they're exposed to a higher you know, potential failure because they can't tolerate the unsupported nature, whereas the billet crank can. But the root cause, in my opinion, is the unsupported nature of this, this extension, or even this one. Now, one of the Jabiru engines I've seen, or the flange available, is really short, barely the bolt's clear. Now, that'd be better, wouldn't it? You've got the propeller basically bolted right on here with a much squattier flange. That would be better. Than, than this one, which is a standard jab, which is a stock jabberoo flange, by the way. Anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, but yeah, so I find it interesting. Yeah, you know, I just find these types of things interesting, and I try and work out, try and understand what's going on. And you know, I'm sure you people in the comments, you'll have your opinions too. But I live this every day. I see this sort of thing every day, and. Um, yeah, I think what's happening is when you're doing hard manoeuvres or turning or even turbulence, that front plate there, that front web is acting as, as I said, a flex plate. It is literally controlling the direction of the crankshaft. And once it's disconnected, it exposes just how sloppy that is. That's outrageous. And I, I'm telling you, those bearings aren't worn out. They're perfectly fine. That is just the natural tolerance of those bearings. That front bearing really should be here, shouldn't it? Well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm exaggerating, but if you could wave a magic wand, you'd want the support bearing about there, wouldn't you? And you wouldn't be able to have any of this, and you wouldn't be exposing that first web um, to, to excessive stresses. Now, I, I don't know if anybody's got a, a, a broken forge crank out there. I know of one, but it was kept pretty quiet. We never got a chance to see it. Um, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's, that's the failure point right there of all cranks. Righto, have a good one. Cheers.